Before Metroid Prime perfected platforming in an FPS, before Mario 64 introduced to the world the 3D platformer, before Duke 3D and Quake ushered in free look and true 3D graphics for an FPS, hell, before FPS was even really a term, there was a charming Doom clone about a robotic bunny named Robit. Jumping Flash is a landmark piece of software that deserves to be celebrated as a pivotal moment in 3D gaming. However, unlike the other games I mentioned, its reputation in the annals of 3D gaming doesn't exactly precede itself, perhaps due to arcane, occasionally clunky controls, and some rough graphics. But while the majority of its 1990s early 3D brethren struggled just to be functioning games, Jumping Flash found success even within far-reaching technical ambitions and a then-burgeoning genre. Not so much flawed as just old, Jumping Flash gets it mostly right and has aged better than it really has any right to. Released on October 10, 1995, Jumping Flash was primarily a technical showpiece for Sony's newly minted PlayStation, so its story is unsurprisingly very simple. The diabolical Hawaiian shirt-wearing Baron Aloha has scooped up pieces of Crater Planet to keep as a giant private vacation retreat. What a jerk! It isn't explained how collecting four carrot icons magically frees each piece of land, but it's a clever way to explain why each level is a self-contained floating island. Plus, it features one of the most inspirational pieces of expository dialogue ever in a video game. Let's go, Robert! Jump and go! Jumping Flash is a hybrid first-person shooter 3D platformer, and its successes here are why this game still impresses. Though the draw distance leaves much to be desired, Robert's triple jump is capable of leaping dizzying heights. The sense of scale and the game's sprawling levels are still really impressive. An important detail is how on the second and third jump, your view automatically tilts down to give you a view of your shadow and your feet. While in the air, you have full control of your movement, allowing ample time to judge your distance to a platform and abort a jump if you think you'll fall short. Because of this, scaling tall structures and maneuvering floating platforms feels easy and natural. Soaring through the air gives the same exhilarating feeling you can find in games like Mirror's Edge or Portal, but here it's the focal point of the entire game. The camera moves very smoothly, and Robert's bobble and flapping feet give the player subtle but important feedback. A visceral and audible thud when you land reminds the player of the powers of gravity, lest they feel too much like a jumping god. It's not without its frustrating moments, but all things considered, Jumping Flash does a damn fine job of letting you know where your feet are at all times. It's when you're not jumping that things get problematic. The absence of any kind of strafing is sorely felt on corridor levels and some boss battles, and a free look button mapped to R1 reminds the player that this was a time before mouse look, much less dual joysticks, were commonplace. Basically, whenever you're not in the air, Jumping Flash controls like crap. Though Father Time isn't so harsh on Jumping Flash, its charming and cute aesthetic is probably more welcome today than it was in its era. But at least at a time when attitude and edge were all the rage, critics in North America saw Jumping Flash as just kid stuff. I can recall my older brother referring to it as cutesy doom, because the idea of a doom clone not being rated M was just crazy talk. But I feel like it helped pave the way for other charming games like Parappa the Rapper and Katamari Damashi. The image of Calypso at the end of Twisted Metal 1, or games like P.O.'d and ESPN Extreme Games, are fluffy nostalgia for some, but naked, hilarious pandering for everyone else. Though not to let it completely off the hook, the short quips belted by our hero have a dry, sarcastic wit about them, so I guess the game isn't without its timely 90s quirks. Collectors will definitely want to track down that beautiful long box case, but for everyone else, Jumping Flash is available on PSN for a couple of bucks, and that's a great price as the game is rather easy and maybe two hours long. There's replay in a time attack mode and a second quest style extra campaign, but what takes the cake is an unlockable super mode, which is the normal campaign with the added ability to run, dive bomb, and jump three more times a total of six goddamn jumps! While this removes almost all difficulty, it's a testament to his technical achievements as I had so much fun jumping from the highest spot I could find and dive bombing down, or jumping high enough just to make the levels disappear. 
In fact, playing this game again, I couldn't help but think how great a remaster would be. Not a remake, a remaster. Keep that low count polygonal aesthetic and the silly story, but fix that frame rate, lock down that draw distance, give me strafing and dual joystick FPS controls, and you'll have a remaster worth people's time. Or at least not some repackaged game they just finished a year ago. Jumping Flash's origins come from either as a technical demo for the PlayStation titled Spring Man, or from a Sharp X 68000 game Geograph Seal. I haven't been able to find any footage or pictures of the Spring Man demo, only passing mentions in magazines, but they allegedly both came out in early 1994. Either way, Geograph Seal definitely looks to serve as a spiritual prequel as it looks to play almost exactly like Jumping Flash. The world at large was first introduced to Jumping Flash by way of being one of the few playable demos on the original PlayStation Pix demo disc. I personally have fond memories of playing World 3-2 on the demo kiosk outside the old KB Toys. Robert was created as a potential mascot for the PlayStation, though we know that Crash Bandicoot would become the de facto face of the system in 96. Jumping Flash got lost in the shuffle as the PlayStation 1 and N64 battled on store shelves. Surprisingly, it was never re-released as a greatest hits. Though this isn't to imply that Jumping Flash was a flop. Also beating Mario 64 to the punch, Jumping Flash 2 was released a scant 8 months after the first. I have less to say about this game though. Fans of the first will definitely enjoy it, but it's more of the same. It features faster load times, improved graphics with things like rain and water effects, a bit more difficulty, and a wonderfully bonkers story about a kabuki banana warlord looking to create the ultimate solo chill zone. Seriously, the cutscenes are pretty crazy and fun. While Part 1 enjoyed praise from critics, Jumping Flash 2 just did not inspire the same enthusiasm, and this might explain why the third game never left Japan. Still, Jumping Flash 2 is available on PSN, and there are definitely worse ways to spend your money. Jumping Flash would require a much larger evolution to be fresh again, and this would actually take shape in 1997's Ghost in the Shell, published by THQ. This is a great action game, overlooked at the time, possibly due to it being based on an anime, but we'll have to save it for another time. 